Why does a person study religion? There are many incidental reasons, but there is only one reason if a person is really in earnest. In a word, it is to come into contact with reality. To find a reality deeper than the everyday reality that so quickly changes, rots away, leaves nothing behind and offers no lasting happiness to the human soul. Every religion that is sincere tries to open up contact with this reality. The following was written by Blessed Seraphim Rose of Platina, California in the 1980s. It talks about how Orthodox Christianity tries to do this, to open up spiritual reality to the religious seeker. The search for reality is a dangerous task. You've all probably heard stories of how young people in our times of searching have, quote, burned themselves out trying to find reality and either die young or drag out a dreary existence at a fraction of their potential of mind and soul. I myself recall a friend from the days of my own searching, around the time that Aldous Huxley had first discovered the supposedly spiritual value of LSD. This young man, a typical religious searcher who might be watching a video like this, once told me, I disagreed. Since even then, I was beginning to glimpse that spiritual life spreads in two directions. It can lead one higher than this everyday life of corruption, but it can also lead one lower and bring about a literal spiritual, as well as physical, death. He went his own way, and before he was 30 years old, he was a wreck of an old man. His mind ruined and any search for reality abandoned. Similar examples could be found among people who seek various forms of psychic experiences, experiment in out-of-body states, have encounters with UFOs and the like. The original count of persons found dead at the Jonestown site has been found to be seriously in error. It now appears there may be as many as 780 bodies total found at the site. The tragedy of Jonestown in 1980 is enough to remind us of the dangers inherent in the religious search. They were grouped together and under their bodies were found the bodies. Our Orthodox literature over the past 2,000 years has quite a few instructive examples of this sort. Here, I'll cite just one from the life of St. Nikitas of the Kiev Caves. Nikitas asked his abbot to bless him to live in reclusion. The abbot forbade him, saying, My son, it's not good for you who are young to be idle. Better for you to live with the brethren. By serving them, you will not lose your reward. You know yourself how Isaac was deluded by demons in reclusion. He would have perished if the special grace of God through the prayers of our Holy Fathers Antony and Theodosius had not saved him. Father, Nikitas replied, I will never be deceived by anything of that kind, but I want to stand firmly against the wiles of the demons and to ask God to give me the gift of miracle working, like Isaac the recluse, who even till now performs many miracles. Your desire, said the abbot again, is beyond your power, beyond your guard, lest having been exalted, you fall. I, on the contrary, order you to serve the brethren, and you will receive a crown from God for your obedience. Nikitas had not the least desire to attend to what the abbot said to him. He carried out what he had set his mind on. He shut himself up in reclusion and continued praying without ever going out. Once when he was praying, he heard a voice praying with him, and he smelled an extraordinary fragrance. Deceived by this, he said to himself, 
If this were not an angel, he would not have prayed with me, and there would not have been the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. Nikitas began to pray earnestly, saying, Lord, manifest thyself to me intelligibly, that I may see thee. Then there was a voice which said to him, I will not appear to thee because thou art young. Lest, having been lifted up, thou fallest down. The recluse replied with tears, Lord, I will never be deluded, because the abbot taught me not to attend to diabolic delusion, but I will do all that thou orderest me. Having obtained power over him, the soul-destroying snake said, It is impossible for a man while still in the flesh to see me. But look, I am sending you my angel to stay with thee. Carry out his will. With these words, a demon in the form of an angel appeared to the recluse. Nikitas fell at his feet and worshipped him as an angel. The demon said, Henceforth do not pray, but read books. In this way thou wilt enter into constant converse with God, and wilt receive the power to give salutary teaching to those who come to thee. And I will unceasingly pray to the Creator of all for thy salvation. The recluse believed these words and was still further deceived. He stopped praying and accompanied himself with reading. He saw the demon constantly praying and rejoiced, supposing that an angel was praying for him. Then he began to talk much from scripture to those who came to him and to prophesy. His fame spread among worldly people and reached the grand prince's court. In actuality, he did not prophesy but he told those who came to him where stolen goods had been put, or where something had happened in a distant place, obtaining his information from the demon who attended him. This was sufficient for worldly people to hail the recluse as a prophet. It is observable that worldly people, and even monks without spiritual discernment, are nearly always attracted by humbugs, imposters, hypocrites, and those who are in demonic delusion and they take them for saints and genuine servants of God. No one could compare with Nikitas for knowledge of the Old Testament, but he could not bear the New Testament. He never took his talks from the Gospels or the Apostolic Epistles, and would not allow any of his visitors to mention anything from the New Testament. From this strange bias in his teachings, the fathers of the Kiev Caves Monastery realized that he was deceived by a demon. They drove the devil from Nikitas by their prayers, and Nikitas stopped seeing it. The fathers brought Nikitas out of reclusion and asked him to tell them something out of the Old Testament. But he affirmed with an oath that he would never read those books which he had previously knew by heart. It turned out that he had even forgotten how to read. So great was the influence of the satanic delusion. Through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, he was brought to himself. He acknowledged and confessed his sin, and he obtained a high degree of sanctity and the gift of miracle working by a humble life among the brethren. This story raises a question. How can a religious seeker avoid the traps and deceptions which he encounters in his search? There is only one answer to this question. A person must be in the religious search not for the sake of religious experiences, but rather for the sake of truth. Anyone who studies religion seriously comes up against this question. It is a question literally of life and death. Our Orthodox Christian faith, as contrasted with the Western confessions, is often called mystical. It is in contact with a spiritual reality that produces results which are usually called supernatural. Which are beyond any kind of earthly logic or experience. One doesn't need to search in ancient literature to find examples. The life of miracle workers in our own days are full of mystical elements. As an example, St. John Maximovich, who died in the 1960s, 
was seen in glowing light, levitated during prayer, was clairvoyant, and worked miracles of healing. None of this, however, is remarkable in itself. It can easily be imitated by false miracle workers. How then do we know that he was in contact with truth? If you look at a textbook of orthodox theology, you'll find that the truth cannot be found by the unaided powers of man. You can read the scriptures or any holy book and not even understand what they say. There is an example of this in the book of Acts. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And the man on the chariot said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture that he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I asked you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way, rejoicing. There are several supernatural mystical elements in this account. The angel tells Philip where to go, although to the Ethiopian, it seems like just a chance encounter on a desert road. And later on, after the baptism, the spirit of the Lord takes up Philip, who disappears before the eyes of the eunuch. But this is not what made the eunuch want to be baptized and become a Christian. There was something else that affected him. Not the miracles, but something in his heart. Miracles, although they sometimes help a person to come to faith, are not the right reason to accept Christianity. In the same book of Acts, we read the story of Simon the sorcerer, who wished to pay money to join the church and gain the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically because they were very spectacular and miraculous gifts. He was in the very lucrative profession of sorcery. At a time when the more supernatural things one could do, the more money and more prestige one would get. As we know from the book of Acts, Simon's request was denied by the apostle Peter, and he came to a bad end, giving us the word simony for the concept of trying to buy the grace of God. By contrast, when Philip spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, something in the eunuch's heart changed. It says in the Acts that he came to believe. His heart was melted by the truth he heard. 
The words of scripture are very powerful. And when the right interpretation is given to them, something in a human being opens up if his heart is ready. Therefore, the eunuch accepted Christ with his whole soul. He was a changed man. This was not for the sake of miracles, but for the sake of that which Christ came to earth to bring. The same thing can be seen in another place of the New Testament. When two of the disciples of Christ were walking on the road to Emmaus, Christ himself, on the very day of his resurrection, joined them and began walking with them, asking them why they were so excited. They in turn began asking him if he was the only one who did not know what had happened in Jerusalem. They said that there was a great prophet who had been killed and that he had allegedly risen from the dead, but they did not know what to believe. Christ then began to open their hearts and explain what the Old Testament said was going to happen to the Messiah. All this time, the disciples did not recognize him, for he did not come to them with signs and wonders to dazzle them. Later on, when they came to Emmaus, he would have gone on further, and he would have departed from them, unrecognized, had they not asked him, out of a simple love for a stranger in need, to spend the night with them. Finally, when he sat down with them and broke the bread, as he had done at the Last Supper, their eyes were opened. They saw that it was Christ himself. And then he vanished right before their eyes. They began to question themselves and remembered that all the time he had been walking with them on the road, they had a burning in their hearts, even though they had not recognized him. What made them recognize Christ in the end was this burning heart, and not just the fact that he vanished out of their sight. Because magicians can do that also. Therefore, it is not first of all miracles which reveal God to men, but something about God that is revealed to a heart that is ready for it. This is what is meant by a burning heart. Here we see how what is called revelation comes about. The heart is moved and changed by the presence of God, or by someone who is filled with his spirit, or by just hearing the truth about him preached. That is also how the apostles had the power to go out to virtually the whole inhabited earth. To India, and perhaps even far as China. To Russia in the north, to Britain in the west, and Abyssinia in the south. In order to preach the gospel to all peoples within the first decades of the resurrection of Christ. It is the same today, even though people have become much more insensitive and dense spiritually, much less simple, and do not respond as easily to truth. In the case of St. John Maximovich, those who have come to believe through him have been moved not first of all by his miracles, but by something that moved their hearts about him. I'll give an example of his life during World War II. And again, we bring you the available report, all of them from German sources, on what the Berlin radio calls the invasion. Where shall I be? It was related to us by a good friend of ours who died a few years ago, a voice instructor named Anna. As she explained it, St. John's fasting was so strict that his lower jaw lost power during fast periods, and he spoke very indistinctly. She had the assignment of giving him lessons to exercise his jaw and make him speak a little more clearly. One of these mornings, four o'clock, where shall I be? He would always come to her at regular intervals, and when he finished each lesson, it was his custom to leave a $20 American bill. Now, during the wartime, this woman was wounded and was dying in a French hospital in Shanghai. It was late at night, there was a fierce storm outside, and no communications were possible in the city. One of these mornings, bright and fair, where shall I be? 
but she had in her heart only one idea. Having been told by the doctors that she was going to die, her only hope was that Archbishop John would come, give her Holy Communion, and somehow save her. She begged people to get word to him, but they said it was out of the question. The phones weren't working because of the storm, and the hospital, since it was a wartime, was locked up for the night. So all she could do was cry out, Help! Archbishop John, come. Of course, people said that the poor woman was raving, for there was no possible contact with him. But that night, as she was shouting these words, the doors opened up in the midst of the storm, and in walked Archbishop John. He came up to her, gave her confession, calmed her down, she was of course overjoyed, then gave her Holy Communion, and left. The woman slept 18 hours after this, and waking up the next day, she felt that she had recovered. It must be the fact that Archbishop John came, she said. What Archbishop John? The nurses asked. The person in the bed next to her said that someone had in fact been there, but still, no one believed her. She began to wonder whether she had been having hallucinations. But as the nurses were making her bed that day, they discovered under her pillow a $20 American bill. Aha, uh -huh, she said. That's the proof he was there. Now how, one may ask, did Archbishop John know? How did he manage to get to her when there was no human communication possible to get the message across to him? One can say that it was revealed to him, because so many things like that were revealed to him. But how was it revealed to him? Why to him and not to someone else? Why is the truth, it would seem, revealed to some and not to others? Is there a special organ for receiving revelation from God? Yes. In a certain sense, there is such an organ, although we usually close it and do not let it open up. God's revelation is given to something called a loving heart. We know from the scriptures that God is love. Christianity is the religion of love. You can look at the failures, see people who call themselves Christians and are not, and say there is no love there, but Christianity is indeed the religion of love when it is successful and practiced in the right way. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself says that it is above all by their love that his true disciples are to be distinguished. If you ask anyone who knew St. John Maximovich what it was that drew people to him and still draws people who never knew him, the answer is always the same. He was overflowing with love. He sacrificed himself for his fellow man out of an absolutely unselfish love for God and for them. This is why things were revealed to him which could not get through to other people, and which he never could have known by natural means. He himself taught that, for all the mysticism of our Orthodox Church that is found in the lives of saints and the writings of the Holy Fathers, the truly Orthodox person always has both feet firmly on the ground, facing whatever situation is right in front of him. It is within accepting these situations, which requires a loving heart, that one encounters God. Even 
though God sometimes has to break down and humble a heart to make it receptive. As in the case of the Apostle Paul, who at one time was breathing fire against and persecuting Christians. But to God, the past, present, and future of the human heart are all present. And he sees where he can break through and communicate. The opposite of a loving heart that receives revelation from God is cold calculation. Getting what you want out of people. In religious life, this produces fakery and charlatanism of all descriptions. If you look at the religious world today, you see that a great deal of this is going on. So much fakery, posing, calculation, so much taking advantage of the winds of fashion in order to bring one religion or one religious attitude into fashion. To find the truth, you have to dig deeper. Thus concludes the first two chapters of God's Revelation to the Human Heart. To dig deeper, you can find the full book in the link in the description below. The following letter is his report of the incident. During the last week of September, I began to notice an unbelievably strong smell of myrrh. I couldn't explain it. Was it all in my head? I asked my wife and she said she didn't smell anything. So I spoke with several other people who visited our home and they too said they didn't smell anything. The icon was dry. Or was it? 